Book 4 Many of these passages in this book concern the supreme virtue of goodness. Those who are truly good love the Confucian way and embody it in every way fashion, completely and self-consciously and effortlessly, as opposed to those who pursue the way because of ulterior motives. Such true gentlemen require nothing from the world but the genuine joy and satisfaction they derive from virtue as opposed to petty people who are motived by considerations of profit or other external goods. This book also contains a series of statements on fly piety that flesh out the treatment in book one. The master said, to live in the neighborhood of the good is fine. If one doesn't choose to dwell among those who are good, how will one obtain wisdom? There are two main interpretations of this passage, one literal, the other more metaphorical, and each is reflected in the two warring states followers of Confucius. We see echoes of more literal taken the Shunzi, therefore, when it comes to his residence, the gentleman is necessarily picky when choosing his village, and in his travels he seeks out the company of other scholars. He does so in order to guard against depravity and crudeness and stay close to the right path of the main. Understood in this way, the focus of the passage is the importance of one's social environment for the development of one's character. A slightly different interpretation is found in Mencius 2a7, where a quotation of 41 prefaced with the following. Is an arrow maker not less benevolent than the arrow armor maker? The arrow maker is concerned solely with harming others, while the armor maker is concerned solely with making sure others not harmed. With shaman doctors and coffee makers, it is the same. Therefore, one cannot be care but be careful in the choice of one's profession. Although here one's dwelling place is understood metaphorically as one's general sphere of activity, the general idea is similar. One must be careful when choosing one's environment. The master said, without goodness, one cannot remain constant in adversity and cannot enjoy enduring happiness. Those who are good feel at home in goodness, whereas those who are clever follow goodness because they feel that they will profit from it. Regarding the first half of the saying, Kong Angua comments, some cannot remain constant in adversity because sustained adversity motivates them to the wrong and cannot enjoy enduring happiness because they inevitably fall into arrogance and slot. The second half is an explanation of the first. Those who are truly good are spontaneously and unselfconsciously good. They are feel at home in virtue, having internalized it to the point that external lies no longer matter. Both Confucius and Yan Hui illustrate this quality. Those who are merely clever are motivated by the external benefits of being virtuous and therefore follow goodness in a more self-consciously goal-oriented manner. The problem with this is that virtue doesn't always pay. So when the going gets rough, these people lack the genuine inner commitment to remain upon the way. Alternately, when virtue does end up paying off with social acclaim, wealth and official position, these clever people, having attained their external end and lacking any commitment to the way as an end in itself, fall into immoral arrogance and idleness. A more elaborate version of this passage in the record of ritual adds a third level of self-consciousness and effort. Those who are good are at ease in goodness. Those who are clever follow goodness because they know that they will profit from it. And those who are afraid of punishment force themselves to follow goodness. See also 620. One who knows it is not the equal of one who loves it, and one who loves it is not equal of one who takes joy in it. The master said, only one who is good is able to truly love others or despise others. Jia Xun, elaborating upon Kang Ango's commentary, explains, the good person loves what is really worthy of admiration in others and despises that which is genuinely despicable in them. This is why such a person is said to be 
be able to love others and despise others. Only the good person is an accurate and impartial judge of character, able to love virtue in others without envy and despise vice in others without malice. The master said, Merely set your heart sincerely upon goodness and you will be free of bad intentions. There are at least two other ways to render the second half of this line, free of hatred or free of wrongdoing. The first seems ruled out by the sense of 4-3. The good person does in fact despise or hate when such an emotion is appropriate. Kong and God's reading may endorse the second reading, but it's somewhat ambiguous. Li Wei argues against the second reading, noting that if the passage means that one who has set his heart sincerely upon goodness will be free of wrongdoing, what will be at be the point of saying it. Of course, a person who has set his heart sincerely upon goodness will be free of wrongdoing. It is more likely that the original meaning is that one will be free of bad intentions. This accords better with the 42. Even a clever person can act in accordance with goodness. But only a true, truly good person truly and spontaneously embodies it in action, emotion and thought. The master said, wealth and social eminence are things that all people desire, and yet unless they are acquired in the proper way, I will not avoid them. Poverty and disgrace are things that all people hate, and yet unless they are avoided in the proper way, I will not despise them. If the gentleman abandons goodness, how can he merit the name? The gentleman doesn't go against goodness even for the amount of time required to finish a meal. Even in times of urgency or distress, he necessarily accords with it. The true gentleman is dedicated to the way as an end in itself, and doesn't pursue it for the sake of external goods. As a result, he embodies the way unconsciously and effortlessly, and derives a constant joy that renders him indifferent to externalities. The Shunzi, where there is goodness, there is no poverty or hardship, and where goodness is lacking, there is no wealth or honor. The master said, I have yet to meet a person who truly loved goodness or hated a lack of goodness. One who truly loved goodness couldn't be surpassed, while one who truly hated a lack of goodness would at least be able to act in a good fashion as he wouldn't tolerate that, which is not good being associated with his person. Is there a person who can, for the space of single day, simply devote his efforts to goodness? I have never met anyone whose strength was insufficient for this task. Perhaps such a person exists, by us, but I have yet to meet him. In 7.30 we read, is goodness really so far away, if I merely desire goodness? I will find that goodness is already here, and in 930 I have yet to meet a man who loves virtue as much as the pleasures of the flesh. A bit of frustration is apparent in all of these passages. We all have the ability to be good if we will simply love it as we should. But how can one instill this love in someone who doesn't already have it? This problem comes again in 612, when the disappointing discipline branch you claims to love the way, but compl complains that he lacks the strength to pursue it. Confucius sharply rebukes him in words that echo for six, those for whom it's genuinely a problem of insufficient strength end up collapsing somewhere along the way. As for you, you de deliberately draw, draw the line. This is the heart of a paradox that Confucius faced. We might refer to it as the paradox of Wu Wei, our problem of how to consciously develop in oneself or instill in others genuine and self-conscious spontaneity. That will come up again and again in the analects. We also see in this passage that hierarchy of moral attainment, positive and self-conscious love of goodness being superior to a mere aversion to immorality. The master said, people are true to talk with regard to what sort of mistakes they make. Observe closely the sort of mistakes a person makes, then you will know his character. 
understood in this way. The point of this passage is that it is unpremediated unconscious actions that one's true character is revealed. And this seems to fit well with the overall sense of book form. The pre tank commentators, however, take this passage as a comment on rulership and the need for understanding. Kong Angua, for instance, remarks, The fact that petty people are not be able to act like gentlemen is not their fault. And so one should be understanding and not blame them. If you observe their mistakes, you can put both unworthies and the fools in their proper places. And this is what it means to be good. The link between goodness and understanding that we find elsewhere makes this a plausible reading. And it is reinforced by the fact that many pre tank versions of the text have mean common people as the subject of the first class. Understood this way, the last part of passage should be rendering something like this is what it means to understand goodness. The master said, Heaven in the morning heard that the way was being put into practice. I could die that evening without regret. The pre tank commentators take this passage in the manner reflected by the translation. He Yan's commentate commentary reads the point is that is approaching that and yes had to hear that the world has adopted the way lanzo says the way is what is employed in order to save the people the sage preserves himself in order to put the way into practice the point is to save people with the way not to save oneself with the way this is why we read that if the way were genuinely heard the heard by world in the morning even if one died that evening, it will be alright. Confucius is pained that the way is not being put into practice, and moreover makes it clear that he is more concerned about the world than his own self. Zhu Xi, on the other hand, understands the passage to mean, having in the morning learned the way, one could die that evening without regret, he comments, if one were able to hear the way, one's life will flow easily and one's death will come peacefully and there will be no, re no more regrets. Both interpretations are plausible. The master said, a scholar official who has set his heart upon the way, but who is still ashamed of having shabby clothes or meager rations, is not worth engaging in discussion. Li Chong comments, those who value what lies with and forget about what lies without. This is why, in past age, those who possessed the way were able to put it in action, cause their family members to forget about their poverty and cause kings and dukes to forget about glory. How much less would they have worried about clothing and food? The master said, with regard to the world, the gentleman has no pre predispositions for or against any person. He merely associates with those he considers right. The verbs of this passage all have to do with social associations, but it can be understood not metaphorically and abstractly. The gentleman has no predispositions for one, for or against anything, and merely seeks to be on the side of the right. In either case, we see here an indication of the situational responsiveness of the gentleman, who relies upon his internal moral sense. Rather than conventional social prodigies when judging people of affairs, Confucius' approval of his conventionally tabooed son-in-law in 5.1 and his suspicion of unexamined social judgment in 13.4 can serve as a practical illustration of this principle. The master said, the gentleman cherishes virtue whereas the pet person cherishes physical possessions. The gentleman thinks about punishments, whereas the pet person thinks about exemptions. Some commentators, such as Li Chong, take this passage to be referring to virtuous government and the relationship between the ruler and the people. When the ruler is virtuous, the people cherish their ab abodes. When the ruler pays attention to enfor enforcing the laws, the people cherish the favors that such good government brings to them. This is possible, but the sense of the passage that surrounded favor the second coming reading, advocated by Zhu Xi and others, that the issue is the gentleman's public impartial 
orientations versus the pet person penchant for personal gain and favoritism. As the Cheng Shude puts it, everyone has a different explanation of this passage, but it seems to me appropriate to indicate my humble opinion of its general gist. The question that occupies the mind of the gentleman all day is how to improve his virtue and perform his job. Whereas the pet person pursues nothing more than his li livelihood and worries about nothing other than his material needs. The gentleman is comfortable with social distinctions and holds fast to the norm. Whereas the pet person has his mind focused upon nothing but profit and, if he falls afoul of the law, tries to avoid punishment without giving it a second thought. The master said, if in your affairs you abandon yourself to the pursuit of profit, you will arouse much resentment. As Master Cheng explains, if you wish to obtain profit for yourself, you will inevitably harm others and thereby arouse much resentment. The gentleman is to be guided by considerations of what is right, not what is prof profitable. The master said, if a person is able to govern the state by means of ritual property and deference, what difficulties will he encounter if, on the other hand, a person is not able to govern the state through ritual property and deference, of what use are the rights to him? Here we see two themes emphasized. The first concerns the efficacy of virtue-based government as opposed to government by force or reward and punishment, and is related to the distaste for contention and considerations of profits expressed through this book. A passage from the commentary described the importance of ritual and deference for the functioning of the state. Deference is the mainstay of ritual property. In an, in an ordered age, gentlemen honor, ability and deferred to those below them while the common people attend to their agricultural labors in order to serve those above them. In this way, both above and below ritual prevail, and slanderers and evil men are dismissed and ostracized. All of this arises from a lack of contention, and is referred to as excellent virtue. When an age declines into disorder, gentlemen strut about announcing their achievements in order to lord over the common people and the common people boast of their skills in order to enrage upon the gentleman. But above and below there is lack of ritual, giving birth simultaneously to disorder and cruelty. All of this arises from people contending over excellence, and is referred to as darkened virtue. It is constant principle that the collapse of the state will inevitably result from such a situation. The second theme is related to the sort of anti-ivory tower attitude expressed in 13.5. Traditional practices are meant to be applied to the real world, not merely studied theoretically. The master said, don't be concerned that you lack an official position, but rather concern yourself with the means by which you might become established, do not be concerned that one has heard of you, but rather strive to become a person worthy of being known. Again, we see a distaste of self-assertion, self-aggrandizement and contention for external goods. The gentleman focuses solely upon achieving the internal goods of the Confucian way. External recognition should and may follow, but is subject to the vagaries of fate and is not inevitable, and in any case is not a virtual object of concern. The master said, Master Zeng, all that I teach can be strung together on a single thread. Guan means thread, and Hong Kong reads it as a metaphor. Everything that the master teaches is unified theoretically by one principle, like objects strung on a single thread. The analog's emphasis on practice over theory make it likely, however, that the single thread is a kind of consistency in action rather than a unified theoretical principle, and this is supported by Master Zeng's elaboration below. See the commentary to 15.3 for more discussion of the single thread.
Yes, Sir Master Zeng responded. After the master left, the disciples asked, what did he mean by that? Master Zeng said, all that the master teaches amounts to nothing more than dutifulness, temperate, I understand it. Although there is a general agreement upon the meaning of Xiao, commentators differ considerably regarding their understanding of Zhang. There are quite few passages in the Analects directly or indirectly concerned with Xiu, and it's clear that this virtue involves some sort of considerations of others, an ability to imaginatively project oneself into another's place. There is more debate about Song. One dominant line of interpretations begins with Wang Bi, who defines Song as fully exhausting one's emotions and Xu as reflecting upon one's emotions in order to have sympathy with other beings. Zhu Xi and others belong to this line of thinking in defining Zong as exhausting oneself or doing one's utmost. Relying solely upon relevant passages from within the analects, however, it will seem that Zong involves a kind of attention to one's ritual duties, particularly as a political subordinate. Understood this way, being beautiful involves fulfilling the duties and obligations proper to one's ritually defined role. This virtue is to be tempered by the virtue of understanding, the ability by means of imaginatively putting oneself in the place of another, not when it's appropriate or right to bend or spend the dictates of role specific duty. Zong is often translated as loyalty but beautifulness. Is preferable because the ultimate focus is one upon ritually prescribed duties rather than loyalty to any particular person, and indeed, Zong would involve opposing a ruler who was acting improperly. The master said, The gentleman understands rightness, whereas the pet person understands profit. Again, the gentleman is motivated by the inner goods of confession practice rather than the promise of external goods. Some commentators argue that the distinction between the gentleman and the pet person should be understood in terms of social class, because Xiaowen is often used in Han texts to indicate simply the common people. It is clear, though, that Confucius felt anyone from any social class could potentially become a gentleman and that social status didn't necessarily correspond to actual moral worth. It is apparent that in the analects, at least, the gentleman distinction refers to moral character rather than the social status. The master said, when you see someone who is mort worthy, concentrate upon becoming their equal. When you see someone who is unworthy, use this as an opportunity to look within yourself. That is. One is to emulate with the virtues and avoid the vices observed in others. The emphasis here is upon action, not just seeing the qualities of others, but also using this insight as an opportunity for self-improvement. As Jia Yuanxi explains, the seeing mentioned in this passage refers to that which any person can easily perceive. The difficulty lies entirely in actual beginning to do something about it. The intention of the sage is in establishing this teaching was not merely to criticize people for not having true knowledge, but rather to operate them for lacking sincerity of commitment or the courage to put their will into practice. The master said, in serving your parents, you might gently remonstrate with them. However, once it becomes apparent that they have not taken your criticism to your heart, you should be respectful and not oppose them, and follow their lead diligently without resentment. One owes one's parents a unique level of obedience, one that transcends legal responsibilities and that exceeds even the demands of dutifulness in the political realm. As Zheng Xuan explains, the patterns of the family says, with a regard to a son serving his parents, if he demonstrates three times and is not heeded, there is nothing left to do but, with crying and tears, go along with their wishes. 
However, it also says, with regard to a minister serving his lord, if he remonstrate three times and is not heeded, he shall leave his lord's service and turn the study of classics. Why is this? Father and son are genuinely linked to one another. With regard to our heavenly nature, there is no relationship like it. For the minister, however, are brought together by considerations of brightness, and it is thus natural that they should have points of divergence. Other commentators are also fond of quoting a passage from the Patterns of the Family chapter. If a parent commits a transaction, the son should, with bated breath, breath a natural expression in a gentle voice, remonstrate with them. If the remonstration is not heeded, he should summon up even more respect in loyalty, and once the parent is pleased again, repeat the remonstration. If the parent is not pleased, it is preferable that the son should strongly remonstrate with them than allow them to commit a crime against the village or country. If the parent subsequently becomes angry or displeased and hits the son so furiously as to draw blood, the son shouldn't dare to take offense, but should summon up even more respect and loyalty. The master said, while your parents are alive, you should don't travel far, and when you do travel, you must keep the fixed itinerary. Going an extant journey will entail neglected one's flyer duties. As for the issue of itinerary, Hong Kong comments, the summary of ritual property says the ritual property, property son dictates that when he goes out, he must inform his parents and that when he returns, he must report to them personally, and that in all of his travels, he must keep a fixed itinerary. If one travels and doesn't have a fixed itinerary, this will cause one's parents undue worry. The master said, one who makes no change to the ways of his father for three years after his father pa has passed away may be called a fly of some. This is a repetition of the second half of 111, see book 1 for a commentary. The master said, you must always be aware of the age of your parents. On the one hand, it is a cause for rejo rejoicing, on the other, a source of anxiety. There are various ways to understand, understand this, but the most plausible is that the age of one's parents is cause for rejoicing that they have lived so long, while also a source of anxiety because of their advancing years. The master said, people in ancient times weren't eager to speak, because they would be ashamed if their action didn't measure up to their words. Again, we see the suspicion of goodness and, and an emphasis on action over speech. Huang Zhen comments, the distinction between the gentleman and pet person lies in whether or not their words and actions are consistent. And whether or not their words and actions are consistent depends upon whether or not their hearts are capable of knowing shame. Wang Yangming adds sharply, the ancients valued action, and were therefore shy with their words and didn't dare to speak lightly. People nowadays will words, and therefore loudly flap their tongues and blubber nonsense at the slightest in the instigation. The master said, very few go astray who comport themselves with restraint. There are two slightly different ways to take this passage. Some, such as Zhao Yu, take restraint to be a supreme virtue. With regard to heavenly way and human affairs, there has never been anything that didn't begin with restraint and end with restraint. Restraint that falls into extravagance cannot last, whereas extravagance tempered by restraint can endure. The summary of ritual property says, arrogance cannot be allowed to endure, desires cannot be indulged, self-satisfaction cannot be countenanced, and joy cannot be taken to extremes. All of this refers to the way of restraint. Another way to understand restraint is as a quality that, while falling somewhat short of constituting full virtue, will at least keep one out of serious trouble. This second reading is more plausible and is reflected in Kwang Angu's commentary.
neither hits fun to me. If one's extravagant, then one's arrogance and excessiveness call down disaster. Whereas frugality and restraint allow one to least be free of troubles or concerns. The master said, the gentleman wishes to slow to speak, but quick to act. Here again we see a concern about one's word exceeding one's actual virtue, as Wung Wuxi comments, with regard to faults that can afflict the student, none is more troubling than carelessness, and few tasks are begun or completed by those who are casual in their behavior. Carelessness reveals itself in speech, speech that follows like brother, that resound like the tongue of reed organ, that is blubbered everywhere without one, even noticing what one is saying. Proof or of excessive casualness is found in one's affairs, in behavior that is overly forward or excessively withdrawn, that is erratic and dis disrespectful, that is time timid and cowardly without one even realizing it. It is only this lack of inclination to be slow to speak and quick to act that prevents the settled ambition of the gentleman from flourishing. The master said, virtue is never solitary, it always has neighbors. A few commentators believe that what it means for virtue not to be alone is that virtue is never one-sided in a true gentleman. He is both internally respectful and outwardly righteous. A more likely interpretation is that the reference is to the attractive power of virtue upon others. As the history of Han explains, when a minister learns of a king who has received the great commission from heaven, he will be naturally drawn to him, in a manner beyond what human beings are capable of bringing about. This is the sort of good omen that manifests itself when one has received the mandate. All of the people in the world will, with one heart, return to such a king, like children returning to their parents. Thus the auspicious sign of heaven are brought about through sincerity. When Confucius says, virtue is never alone, it always has neighbors, he is referring to the effects caused by accumulating goodness and piling up virtue. For this interpretation, reading the passage together with for one, the point might also be that one requires good neighbors and friends in order to develop virtue for this interpretation. Chapter 1, 8, 9, 30, 12, 24 Ziu said, being overbearing in service to a lord will lead to disgrace, while in relating to friends and com companions it will lead to estrangement. The word translated as overbearing here means literally to count, and although there is a great deal of commentarial controversy about how exactly to understand it, most of proposed readings are extensions of the sense of to count to enumerate either one's of achievements or the faults of others, to be petty, to pay excessive attention to detail, etc.